Thanks, Dave. I was going to say now for some light release, Genesis 19 and Judgment. Um, so strap yourselves in. It's funny, when, I'm, when I was first given this sermon and the passage, I put it in my calendar as um, Judgment Day. And this morning got quite a shock when my alarm went, bloop, Judgment Day. Um, so let me, um, let me jump straight in. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, in fact, even if you've not been a Christian, I expect you'll still agree with me on this point. Sometimes you read a passage in the Bible and it is just hard. It's hard to understand. It's hard to agree with. It's hard to believe even sometimes. Um, It's just hard. Brace yourselves, we arrive at such a passage this morning. Um, and I just, I just want to say this out front, and, uh, and before I do anything else, I really love the Bible, I really do. I think it's, it's the most excellent book ever written. Um, it, I, I actually see it as kind of my number one calling in life, above and beyond anything else that I might do in my life to help people to fall in love with this book because it has transformed me. It has transformed millions across the world. I want to help people fall in love with this book, some for the first time, some more in love, and that's kind of my goal this morning, even preaching through such a difficult passage. It's actually my primary source of authority on all things in life, everything. The Bible determines what I believe about everything else. It's where I go to, it's my baseline. If I need to know the truth on an issue, if I'm presented with some information that I've not heard before, I weigh it, I test it, I view it through the lens of this book. And I'm just putting my cards on the table. I am Bible big. I love it. I think it's great. I'm literally big as well. I'm as big as the Bible. I, I, I'm a maximalist when it comes to the Bible. This is my source of authority. And that's not to say that I'm not influenced by other things. You know, I'm in touch with culture, I get things that are going on and I try and understand them, but this is where I go to, the Bible is where I go to, to understand those things. So if my heart, if my gut instinct when I'm reading the Bible tells me something, if, it, if I feel something, maybe it's a negative emotion, maybe it's unbelief, maybe it's doubt, what I do is I scrutinise that emotion through the Bible and through the truth that I know in the Bible. And I believe every word, in every verse, in every passage of the Bible is suitable. The Bible actually says it's profitable for teaching us about who God is and what he's all about. And so I'm not going to shy away from this passage this morning and digging below the surface of the passage and addressing some of the things that this passage talks about. As a church, we've been working our way through a sermon series on the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and the story of Abraham and his life. We've called it a journey of faith. And that's largely because the main theme of Abraham's story is just that. It's a journey he takes by faith. And as a leadership team, the community church, we're really believing that God will use this incredible story of faith to shape and transform us here to be a people who journey with faith in this new season of life post-COVID, even with the news that we face at the minute. We've needed faith. We've needed faith recently for this incredible gift day we recently had. I wasn't here last week, but I listened to Dave's sermon as he confessed that at times he lacked faith when Adrian declared how much money we wanted to raise for the gift day. And I too confess, along with David, that I was sceptical. When Adrian stated the figure, I was like, it's post-COVID. Lives have been changed. Incomes have been lost. There's no way we're going to raise that money. And perhaps didn't pipe that up. But inside I was doubting. And yet God showed up. He showed up miraculously. And he has blessed us incredibly with the gift day. And then just a personal testimony of walking in faith. These last few years, me and Gemma, as many of you will know, have had an immensely difficult time. In the space of 12 months, we lost parents. And then in mid-2020, we were told that the baby we were expecting had died. And we lost a baby. And 
So in January, when Jem told me that she was pregnant again, I was terrified and I lacked faith. I doubted. And just this week on Monday, we had the scan and the baby's bouncing and alive and happy. Yeah. <laughs> we praise God. Um, God is faithful. We've sang songs about that. Please be praying for us. It's going to be um, a fun journey. Um, <laughs> the only word I can think of, it's probably not the right one. And perhaps we as a church need faith for this terrible situation that we've seen in the news this week in Ukraine. And I've been overwhelmed to learn of some of the things Christian men and women have done in faith in that country. And like Dave said, we can't go into details and share the details of that, but setting up places of safety and refuge, corridors of safety as Trev prayed about on Friday, where people can come and they can be safe and they can hear the gospel. And the churches there are believing it's a time for harvest. It's, I've been blown away by their journey of faith. And that's what we're here to talk about this morning, a journey of faith. How? How can we have faith? One of the ways I think that we can have faith is just to look at God, look at his character, look at who he is and what he's about, and then answer those questions that we might have where we require faith. Who is God? What's he about? And that's how I want to approach this difficult passage this morning. Just a quick note on the sermon. Um, I wrote the sermon hoping not to leave any elephants in the room because there's a ton of them in this passage. Um, and I hope to address as much questions that come up from this passage as possible, but... We're, we're already a way through. It's not going to be possible to definitively comment on this passage. So if you've come hoping for a full and thorough commentary on Genesis 19, you will leave disappointed. I'm going to leave stuff out. I won't pay careful enough attention to some of the issues that are important to you. You have been warned. But let's use this as a starting point to have conversations about the Bible, even the difficult bits, and talk about it openly and honestly and, and share and learn together. So open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 19, that caveat in place. I said I was going to read from the NIV, but some of the language there is probably um, not safe for little ears, so I've changed to the ESV at the last minute. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords... Please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may raise up early and go on your way. And they said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them um, strongly. So they turned aside and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out and the men at the entrance shut the door after him and said, I beg you, brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who, you have, not known, who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot, and they drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them. They shut the door, and they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great. I just find my place, I've lost it. This is small, Dave, this week, so I'm struggling. So that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone else you have in the city? Bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out from this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. 
As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. It's fun, this, isn't it? But he lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside of the city. As they brought them out, one of them said, Escape for your life. Don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to him, Oh no, Lord, my Lord. Behold, your servant has found favour in your sight, and you've shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I can't escape to the hills, lest disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it's a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favour also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of that city was called Zoar. We're nearly there, folks. We're nearly there. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar, and then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulphur and fire from the Lord out of the heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife looked behind him. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord and he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the land of the valley. He looked back and behold, smoke of the land went up like smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Um, I'm going to stop reading there. There is another passage that I will address in my sermon. I'm just aware of the time, and it's difficult reading that out loud. I'm just going to be honest. So let me pray quickly, and then we'll look at that in some more detail. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is challenging for us. It's designed to shape us. It's designed to be an example to us. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning through this difficult passage of sin and destruction. You would help us to see your goodness and your glory in all of this. In Jesus' name. Amen. So here's a few questions that immediately sprang to my mind, and I'm just going to say them as they are when I sat down to study this passage in prep for this sermon. Why did Lot offer up his daughters to the lustful men of the city? Why is Lot considered righteous and therefore rescued by the angels when his actions seem to be pretty horrific, if you ask me? Why didn't God just leave Lot's wife alone? What's wrong with her looking back? What does this passage teach about sexuality and sexual ethics? Why did Lot's daughters do what they did in the cave? And that's the passage I didn't read out, but I'm sure you're aware of what goes on there. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place? What was that all about? Isn't that a little bit heavy handed? And I'm sure as you read, many questions came up for you as well as you read that passage and many things popped into your head. What I want us to do is bear these questions in mind as we consider the character of God in this story. We're not necessarily going to come out with answers for every question I've raised and every question you might raise, but I'm hoping we'll come out equipped to at least be honest with these questions and tackle them. The first thing I want to say about the nature of God in this passage is that he is the righteous judge. The Bible makes that point clear time and time and time again that God is perfectly righteous and that he alone is capable of judgment. That's part of who God is, that's part of what he's about and if I'm honest, in a world full of injustice, I am glad that there is a perfect righteous judge that sits on the throne. And I think that's so important to understand when we approach a text like this because Honestly, there's a danger for us to be so emotionally affected by what's going on in the passage. I was overcome just reading it then. That we can impose our emotions and our emotional morality on the text and on God. And we can, we can kind of judge his actions. And we, we might look and conclude, well, I wouldn't do it that way. Therefore, God must be wicked. God must be evil. And the problem with thinking like this, I'm sure you can spot it, is that we elevate our own opinions and our own thoughts above those of God. It's a huge problem. The Bible teaches that God is perfect in his goodness. And that 
is what it means to be righteous. He is perfect in his goodness. And the Bible also teaches that because God is perfectly good, he determines what is good and what isn't good. He gets to choose. He can judge the whole world because he's the only one perfectly good enough to do it. And that means his judgments are always right, even if we don't feel like they are. In his righteousness, God determined Sodom and Gomorrah needed to be destroyed and the inhabitants in it needed to be destroyed. I'm not going to apologise for that. That is just the truth. In his righteousness, that was what God determined. But in this decision, we actually learn something else about God's character and it is massive. It's enormous. Think back to last week when Dave took us through Genesis chapter 18. In 18... We get this discussion between Abraham and the angels and God himself about how God should deal with the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham challenges God's decision to destroy the cities in his wrath. And Abraham says, what if you find someone that's righteous in that city? And God humours Abraham a little bit and he says, okay, I'll send my angels there. We'll see if we can find some righteous people in the city. And they come to Lot. (laughs) And I, I have to laugh. They come to Lot. A man by all human understanding of the word righteousness doesn't fit the bill at all. I mean, we've learned a lot about Lot. He doesn't really seem very righteous to me. And they choose to save him and those associated with him from the destruction because he's righteous. And I just want to ponder that in a little bit more detail because, I don't know about you, that causes me to scratch my head a little bit. It feels contradictory. Peter, a disciple of Jesus, wrote in the book 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, that Lot was rescued because of his righteousness. Biblical fact, Lot was saved because of his righteousness. And I believe this to be true. I believe Peter was writing down biblical fact. But there's some stuff in this passage that we've got to contend with, right? Why would a righteous man offer up his virgin daughters to be, you know what happened... Uh, You know what he offered them up for? How is this the actions of a righteous man, a righteous father? I'm a father. That sickens me to my core. It doesn't feel very righteous. So far, in fact, Lot's actions have looked far from righteous. He went his own way from Abraham. He chose to reside in a sinful and wicked place, the city of Sodom. And now this, he offers up his own flesh and blood. And let's say we found a way to justify Lot's actions. Let's say we found a way to say he was a really good guy. Just pretend with me for a second. How then do we hold in tension that with this other biblical truth that we find in Romans chapter 9? There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away and he goes on and on to say there is no one righteous. Big questions we're asking this morning, right? They're huge. Okay, which one is it? Is Paul right or is Peter right? Was Lot righteous or is there no one that's righteous? How do we weigh those things together? How do we hold them in tension? And how do we bring in our own kind of gut feelings about who Lot is into that? How on earth do we deal with this? Honest question, right? Well, that's why I wanted to look at the character of God this morning. Because with that perspective, what do we learn about God here? Rather than what does this passage teach us about humanity? What is it, what, what's, what's in it for me? Let's think for a second. What does this passage teach us about God? And we learn something spectacular about God in this. We learn that he is first made merciful. And secondly, he is gracious. And these are two of the most important attributes of God that you will find in the Bible. Because they don't just play a role here in the life of Lot. They are crucial to our position before God as well. You and I this morning, how we sit before God, what God thinks of us, is dependent on these attributes. Firstly then, God is merciful. By the way, just because the Bible records something as having happened, like we read here, despicable stuff, doesn't mean it condones what happens. I don't want you to leave here thinking God condones Lot's actions. He doesn't. Lot's behaviour, as you might have guessed, is disgusting. It's wrong on every level and is not in any way, shape or form righteous. Lot isn't righteous. He is sinful. 
Equally, his daughter's behaviour in the latter parts of the chapter, in deceiving Lot and committing incest, that too is sinful and unrighteous. God could have destroyed Lot alongside the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and to be honest, I'd have been perfectly morally happy with that. It's a kind of reasonable thing for a good and righteous God to do, to destroy Lot. In fact, God could choose to do that to us right now. He could. Because sometimes, and this is going to be hard for everyone to hear, it's hard for me to hear, sometimes we like to think of ourselves, we look at people like Putin, we look at people like Lot, Hitler, and we think, well, that's obviously unrighteous. That's obviously bad. Shame on you, but I'm British. I'm reasonably good. I might have told the odd lie or whatnot, but I'm, you know, I'm not that bad. That's not true. We all, before God, face the same fate. We are all deserving of his wrath. We deserve his judgment on us. But God spares us. And he spared Lot. And that's what mercy is. It's sparing someone from the punishment they rightfully deserve. And then secondly, God is gracious. This is how we reconcile that tension between Peter declaring Lot as righteous and Paul saying no one is righteous. We hold these things together because God is gracious. God doesn't just spare people from what they deserve in his mercy. He also gives people what they don't deserve. God imputes, he gives to Lot his righteousness. Lot is spared and considered righteous, not because of Lot, not because of who Lot is or what Lot is about, but because of who God is and what God is about. And that is the central point of the Christian faith too. I often hear well-meaning Christians say things to people with low self-esteem, saying things like, you're enough, you are perfect to God. And there's good motivation behind that. I don't want to attack the motivation, but it misses something. There's a famous Christian song that we all sing called Amazing Grace. And that better describes our condition before God. We are wretches, it says in that song, saved a wretch like me. That's who we are. In the eyes of God, we are wretches. We're not worthy of his affection. We're not worthy of his love in and of ourselves. And I know that can sound harsh and offensive. It sounds the same to me. I'm not trying to sort of be a bit holier than thou. It sounds the same to me. It's, it's abrasive. It makes me feel a bit uncomfortable to think I'm not worthy in and of myself. But it's the truth. We're not good. Not really. Deep down inside, we're all broken, we're all flawed, we're all imperfect. Because of who we are, what we do, the things we think, even the things that we wouldn't admit to anyone else, we deserve God's hatred and his wrath. But because of who God is, he has spared us from that in his mercy. And he's forgiven us from that. By his grace, he's given us a new identity, a righteous identity. So if as a Christian you're suffering from low self-esteem, the trick is to think less of yourself, honestly. It's to think less of your self-worth and where you stack up and think more about who God is and how good God is because that is your identity in Christ. You are a new creation. You're being conformed to his image. It's no longer the wretched, miserable, unworthy you that lives, but Christ who lives in you. You've died to yourself and you live for Christ. There's now, therefore, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And that's amazing. It's not because of me. It's not because of the things I've done. It's not because of you and the things you've done. It's all because of him and who he is. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And this is the situation we read about with Lot. Righteous Lot isn't righteous by his own deeds. Clearly not. He's righteous because God is graceful. We're told in the New Testament that the events in the Old Testament are designed to serve a purpose for us today, to be an example to us, to teach us about God and an example of life and how we should live a godly life and an example of why the gospel is so crucial to us. Humans throughout history, right down today, have chosen to disregard and disobey God. And rather than worshipping the God who made them and created them in his image, we instead worship gods that we've made for ourselves in our own image. 
God's with our morality. God's with our preferences, the things that we like and don't like. God's that would quickly condemn people like Putin and Hitler, but not condemn ourselves. We worship anything but God. We worship status. We worship money. We worship our families. We worship job security, home security. We worship our own desires, our preferences. We put all of these things before the God of the Bible. And because of that, we deserve to face this perfect judge. We deserve to hear the words, you stand condemned. That's what we deserve. Our sentence should be hell. Forever separation for me and for you. That's, that's what it should be. That's the reality, and it's uncomfortable and it's sad, but it is the reality. What's worse, though, is that we sometimes hear this and think, well, it's okay, I can make it up to God. I might try and live a good life and try and do good things to, to make it up to God and make God smile on me and maybe he'll forgive me because of that. I might go to church because that's the right thing to do. I might, I might attend church because, you know, that, that makes me a good person, right? I might give to charity. I might be really generous with my money because maybe that'll help. Maybe that'll make me look good and, and make me feel better about myself. But the reality is we cannot. Anything we do, we can't make it up to God. Sorry to be so bleak. It is the truth, though. But God is merciful and God is gracious. And that's all I want you to remember from this long-winded sermon this morning. At this point, I'm going to invite Ollie and the band back up as I bring this down to land. He has made a way for us to be spared from what we deserve and he's given something, something immense, something awesome that we don't deserve. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus, God himself, who knew no sin, lived a perfect, spotless, and blameless life. And he died on the cross. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. And Jesus rose from the dead. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, that's our reality, as in Adam, all die. So, in Christ, all will be made alive. And that's where Genesis 19 led me. This difficult passage full of human sin, full of wicked immorality, is full of God's grace and his mercy to us. We're reminded when we read passages like that of a God who in Jesus Christ made a way for us to be reconciled to him and called righteous. Just like Lot is called righteous. No matter who you are today, no matter what you've done, no matter what you think of yourself, you too can be declared righteous because of the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus. And with that, you should worship. Yes, Lord, we, we are here to worship you today. Lord, even in difficult situations where your judgment is enacted, even when we see your wrath on display, we look to your incredible grace, your incredible mercy that has spared us from a similar faith, your immense grace that has gifted us beyond compare. I don't deserve to be here this morning, raising my hands and praying and, and, and living in you, but you have made a way because you are so gracious. You're so beautiful. You are altogether lovely and altogether worthy of my praises. Amen. Amen.